Hello and welcome to Swiftly Spoken, a fan-made Taylor Swift podcast in which we analyse her artistry, including her lyricism, music videos and full album retrospectives. As always, we are your hosts, Lisa and Cameron, and in this episode, we're going to be discussing our theories about 1989 Taylor's version and the 1989 Vault. In this episode, we're going to be briefly giving our ideas about how the release of 1989 Taylor's version could go, what promotion she could do, and the general aesthetic that she might attribute to this album. We'll also be giving our theories of possible 1989 Vault songs and our hopes for Vault collaborations. So far, Taylor's released two singles, so say, from 1989 Taylor's version. So obviously we've had Wildest Dreams, Taylor's version, which was featured in the Spirit Untamed movie trailer and then officially released in September on the 17th in 2021 um, due to the original version becoming a trending audio on TikTok. And then obviously recently on the 6th of May 2022, Taylor also released This Love, Taylor's version, which was also featured in a trailer, but for the upcoming Amazon Prime television series, The Summer I Turned Pretty. As well as these two official singles, so say, we've also had a snippet of Bad Blood Taylor's version, which was featured in the trailer for the DC League of Super Pets. However, unlike the previous two songs, Bad Blood Taylor's version has not been officially released. And also unlike the previous two songs slash trailers, the Super Pets trailer was not promoted by Taylor on her socials, um, which was slightly strange, really. Do you have a kind of maybe a reason why this was the case, why it was featured in a trailer but hasn't been released? And was featured in a trailer but also not then promoted by Taylor. I'm not sure because we did get confirmation that this was Taylor's version somehow right? Yeah I, I think so like I said it's it's almost a bit up in the air really like because I was thinking today yeah. like did it was it definitely confirmed that this is Taylor's version and I'm sure that it is I would be surprised if it wasn't. I do remember there being quite a, a lot of talk about it at that point um, and if you look it up there are like reports of it being Taylor's version, but yeah, it's strange to see that it wasn't promoted at all. So perhaps there was something else going on there. Maybe Taylor allowed them to license the song at that point. Not too sure about that, but it is very different to what has happened with Wildest Dreams and This Love. Yeah, it is strange, but like I said, it is kind of taken as Taylor's version. It's hard Mm. to kind of tell really with these things because obviously they're supposed to sound like the original. So though we don't really know if and when 1989 Taylor's version is coming. The recent release of This Love has got us all very excited again, so we thought we could discuss how she might release this album and how she could promote it and what aesthetics it might have. In terms of its release, a lot of people are thinking that they could be a surprise release. That seems to be uh, the biggest theory at the moment for both 1989 and Speak Now. How do you feel about that? I I think that it's realistic, but I also think that it's wishful thinking. I think the reason for the surprise release is because people are thinking she hasn't teased anything. So, (laughs) yeah, like we want it now. And then a surprise release means we get it instantly. So um, I think it's more hopeful thinking rather than actual realistic because it's only we've only ever really had a surprise release for obviously Folklore and Evermore, which were different reasons for the surprise release, you know, than... I think with these re-records, there needs to be some sort of clarity so that people... I, do, I don't know if it, maybe it, it's a good plan to just surprise drop something that's technically already released and is a re-record. I don't know if you need to build up a bit of hype. I'm not sure how successful that would be. I think it would be incredibly successful, but, you know, I'm well, not sure. Well, it's 1989, so I think success yeah. is guaranteed because of how big the album already is. Yeah, but it's definitely. funny to see and compare. Obviously for Fearless we had more of a traditional rollout whereas for Red we had yeah. an announcement, then Radio Silence and then it all dropped on that one day. So it would be also interesting to see obviously 1989 had a very big era surrounding it, a lot of build up, a lot of hype, yeah. a lot of appearances. So it would be interesting to see whether she instead of going for a surprise release, kind of emulates that. And in a way, 1989 Taylor's version era is kind of been, we, we're kind of in it in a way. Also kind of remi- reminds me of the 1989 era because of how drawn out it's becoming in a way. I think like you said, yeah, the 1989 album is so successful that realistically it's not, there's no debate that it won't be received well or be popular because it's the one that people really, really want. Because obviously it's it's Taylor's kind of biggest like commercial kind of album. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, it will do well no matter what. But yeah, it's interesting whether, I think we've discussed it before about with these Taylor's versions, how the releases will be different and whether there will be a different approach for each release and maybe a surprise release is taking a different approach. 
um, rather than, like you said, with Red announcing it and then waiting a period of time and then it all coming at once, or Fearless, a kind of more traditional release of, you know, lead single, promos, then full album. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that a surprise release would be really cool. I'm not too sure about the double release. Mm, like we said which, in our previous episode, Yeah, it would would just kind of feel slightly overwhelming with a Speak Now release. So, uh, personally, I don't think that's likely to happen, but I do think that maybe a surprise release is likely to happen, especially with the fact that it seems like 989 again like we've said has been seems like it's been ready in some capacity for a while so there might be more of an incentive to get it out because these are the songs that to be used for advertising and uh you know promotion and have big streaming numbers a lot of people because of that are believing that perhaps 1989 is now the summer album it's the next thing coming and it does have a summer feel to it the album as a whole even though originally it came out in october I've always related 1989 to Summer. I don't know about you. Yeah, definitely. I get that kind of feel with those songs, definitely. And we've also got a lot of Easter eggs surrounding it being kind of released. Last last spring, we got Easter eggs, which pointed to that summer. Last summer, obviously, that didn't happen. Yep. Uh, and then this year, again, we've had these, you know, kind of merch drops and different rumblings of different kind of Easter eggs that seem to be teasing towards something summery and well at the point at this point 1989 and speak now um but obviously with this love being released again we're leaning more towards 1989 uh but they all seem to amount to nothing in the end yeah they definitely do like i think the biggest kind of culprit of that is the interview with stephen colbert it just hasn't kind of led to anything and then obviously last year's summer collection just the summer thing the colors. the colors of the album yeah it says 959 all over it definitely nothing ever happened again we've had two singles we've now had another two merch shops one of which is it has 989 stuff in the other one is of this love and again is a summary one and kind of references the just the summer thing collection of last year so it's just it seems like there's so much kind of stuff that points towards it but then never leads to anything and i think like we've said in previous episodes we're not sure whether this is because of issues with lawsuits and copywriting but i would really like a summer release even though obviously originally it was wasn't released in summer um, but I think that now it would be quite nice to have it for summer and, you know, you want to hear like style, you know, like driving in the middle of summer, like you want these songs for summer and everyone really, really wants them now. I think that's why a lot of fans are very antsy at the moment because they don't, we, yeah. none of us know. I mean, as we've discussed, there's issues with Shake It Off, there's a lawsuit ongoing. That has now been rescheduled. It was scheduled to take place in August. Now it's rescheduled to, I believe, November. So Gosh. again, this could be something that drags on. However, it doesn't necessarily stop her from releasing or singing Shake It Off because it's already out there in the world anyway. Yeah. I So I don't know how much of a detriment it could be to a lawsuit such as that one. But uh, yeah, we, we have no idea really of, of what's going on behind the scenes, but it would feel right to have 1989 in, in the summer. It would... I think it would fit. An interesting thing that we can discuss, though, is wishfully thinking what ways could she perhaps promote this album? And one idea that I've always had around in my head, which I don't know if she would do, but then again, she is kind of emulating the looks of yes. the past, uh, you know, old tailors, if you will, like for Fearless, we had her with more more of a curly hair look um, as much as she as she can. Uh, for red, she really, really grew it out, and she had like such a similar haircut as well. It's oh really... yeah, with the proper bangs and everything. Yeah, yeah, uncanny valley to see the two things and compare them. And then obviously for 1989, she originally had her hair like chopped off, and I keep wondering, will she cut her hair again? Because that would be a moment. It would be really cool if she did, and I think especially for the cover, I think that then mm. again, there's been lots of debates, hasn't there, about um, the fact that some people feel like the covers don't aren't feeling distinct enough from each other because they're all from the same photo shoot so i think that mm. that would be really good for the photo, photo shoot itself if she did cut her hair um but yeah and it would just be quite cool it would really make it feel like the 1989 era and she would really look she would really emulate the look that she was going for during the original era like she did with red and the fact with that tiktok um where she was kind of drinking the wine and putting those glasses on and she just looked like red era taylor it was insane yes and it was crazy it was just like that could be red era taylor if if tiktok was about in 2012 like that could be her so mm. no i think that that um 
who were really cool and talking about the cover that's yes. another thing that is obviously debated a lot because the 1989 cover is so iconic with the fact that it's a polaroid and obviously the seagull vintage jumper so how do you feel about that do you think that taylor is gonna either reuse that jumper or we're gonna get a new jumper oh, it's gonna be a polaroid be what are you thinking what are you thinking about that I'm not sure. Obviously, we have a lot of backstory to that cover because we also got some like info about it in the Lover Deluxe Diaries where she yep. mentioned that she originally had a different cover in mind, but she wasn't very sure about it. She saw this Polaroid like as she was sorting through and when she saw it, she just knew it was like mysterious, but at the same time, really eye catching. Yeah. And um, it has become quite an iconic cover. It's such a random photo, but at the same time, it, just the aesthetic is just 1989 it really yeah. encompasses it it really does so i really do hope that somehow seagulls are involved i think they will i do especially with the merch, merch. Yeah. exactly exactly and i think which is something you said to me as we i think in a, a personal discussion between us um how they taylor nation or taylor herself have kind of like seen that specific elements from songs like the all too well scarf or um the diary that we well, cardigan. the cardigan yeah the yeah. the book slash diary all of those things kind of like have become merch items the ring for for the red cover red, yeah and i think that if she incorporates something with seagulls in the cover that could be another amazing idea yeah and really I think that yeah. they're really, I think they're really pushing for that. And they've realized that that is a really good selling point because uh, like I've spoke to people that aren't Taylor fans and don't really know about all too well. And they'll be like, oh, is that the scarf song? The scarf song. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, that's like the way that people know um, about it. And it's like a really, really good selling point and a really good kind of clever merchandising. Um, and the cardigan is the same when obviously folklore is released. Everyone wanted that cardigan. All the mm -hmm. celebrities were wearing it, you know, and it's like an iconic image. In the middle of summer. Everyone... <laughs> yeah, in the mid yeah, in the middle of summer, like rocking this thick, like winter cardigan. And yeah, it was like everyone was like, Oh, that's the Taylor Swift cardigan. And you know, so because obviously for the Wildest Dreams cover, we have a jumper, but obviously with stripes. Yeah. Um, hmm. which could I wouldn't be mad if that was the nineteen eighty nine jumper as such, the album jumper. But um, right. I would I would I would like it to I don't know if she would be able to wear the original because obviously I'm not sure about the rules on that and whether it'd be too close to the original cover. And if there's kind of right. copyright and legal rules around that, I'm not sure, because yeah. as we know, the original is a vintage one, but then they recreated it for a merch yeah. um, item. So I'm not sure about that, but it would be really cool if they either recreated it or did something similar just in terms of having a cover, having a jumper. So I, I really hope so, because I think that it would be a shame if we didn't. I also hope that we do get kind of like a Polaroidy, which yes. I think she's going to go for since we have got the Wildest Dreams cover and the This Love cover. Both of them kind of emulate or have been turned into Polaroids. So yes. I do think that we're going to get whatever we get, be it from the photo shoot, like cut photos from the photo shoot that we haven't seen yet or a different kind of photo shoot or maybe one similar to the Wildest Dreams. I do think that it will be a Polaroid, sorry. I hope so. I, I hope so that it's not because as much as I like the other two covers, I just they do just feel a bit strange with the white border because I know they're supposed to look like a mock Polaroid, but they just yeah. don't feel like one. You know, I, I feel like there could be so much more effort to make them look a bit more Polaroid. -y. So I, I really hope that we actually get real Polaroids because that was the big thing of the 989 album. And like, yes. I remember when it came out, everyone was buying Polaroids again. And it was just so I hope, I really hope that we get a Polaroid. I think she and, will. And I hope that we either get a photo shoot, um, if it isn't part of the Folklore Fearless, um, uh, Evermore Fearless Red photo shoot, I hope that the photo shoot will either be kind of in New York, like the original one, or by the beach. I'm a big sucker for the Rolling Stone magazine photo shoot, so anything that emulates <laughs> yeah. that, and I'm happy. And I think, yeah, that might incorporate some of the seagull element. I do think 1989 has a lot of imagery that she could work with, and also very polemic, but now we basically have had the confirmation that 1989's colour, the era colour, is blue. Blue, yes. Not beige, not yes. brown, as some people thought. So yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, which, it, yeah, I, I've always kind of felt like it is kind of bluey with the, blue. especially with the like seagull jumper and the kind of, and I don't know, I think that, yeah, and then the tour had a lot of blues and purples and. Um, there has always been a debate. So yeah, let us definitely. know. 
what you thought it was. Did you do you think 1989 is more blue? I know some people also say purple because the 1989 Seagull Jumper on the album artwork, yeah, like the Polaroid, true. fades it to purple. Some people really defend beige, so let us know what you think. But I do agree with it being that nice little baby blue. Yeah, I think I think it's a nice colour and suits the album really well, definitely. Turning now to the songs on 1989, Taylor's version, obviously the ones that are confirmed to be included are all of the standard songs, which are 13, plus three deluxe versions songs. Uh, other than that, to be honest with you, 1989, Taylor's version is very difficult to discuss because there are no leaks from the era, there's no unreleased musings around or any ideas, but we have gathered some of the predictions that we have and some rumours that fly are flying around to discuss them. Firstly, this one is probably basically confirmed, I would think, as long as she can get Kendrick Lamar involved again. I hope that she's including the Bad Blood remix featuring Me Kendrick too. Lamar. I, I, We've I would already be, discussed, uh, we love this one. Yeah, I would be amazed if this wasn't on there. This is the official single of Bad Blood. It's the one that is prob probably gets the most streams, really. And it's the coolest one. Like, it is the best out of the two. Like, personally, it's so cool. I would... It'd be such a shame if she couldn't get it, but I do think that she could get Kendrick back on. I don't think there's any issues there. Um, so I, I think, think that, so. I think that that could definitely work, and um, and it would kind of be included as a kind of um, a bit like today was a fairy tale, kind of past after the d deluxe tracks, but before the vault tracks. Vault. Um, exactly. So yeah, hmm. I, I'm. I think that that's kind of ninety nine point nine percent confirmed and expected really i don't know how she's going to go with mvs because obviously for yes. fearless we didn't really get any mvs for red we did uh it was a vault track but if she was to do any recreation of mvs i've always thought that a bad blood mv the original one was so iconic but if she mm. could reunite like some of the characters from that one plus some new friends that she's made along the way that would be a moment that would be really cool. It'd be really cool. Almost like a part two. 1989 is very, it was a very <laughs> visual era. It has a lot of, of music videos uh, already. So if she was to do more of a visual album kind of take on anything, it could be this album's vault tracks. It's just to make 1989 Taylor's version as bombastic and as big as 1989 original was. I do think that she could, def yeah. I agree with you, she could definitely capitalize from producing music videos for a couple of vault tracks and making it more of a not an entirely visual album because we're not going to get you know from track one to track whatever but a few more adding to like the taylor swift cinematic universe i definitely think that it would yeah. work to really expand upon upon the album and the album story now we're going to discuss some of our theories and predictions for Vault Tracks. So as previously mentioned, we said about the Bad Blood remix with Kendrick Lamar. Obviously, this would not be deemed a Vault Track and would be featured on the track list. As we said, like today was a fairy tale on Ronan after the deluxe tracks, but before Vault Ones. So we kind of are pretty certain that that's very likely to be on the track list. However, there's some other tracks like Sweeter Than Fiction. So this was released uh, for the One Chance soundtrack and released in 2013. Um, so how do you feel about this song? Do you think that this is likely to appear on 1989? Obviously it didn't appear on Red, so um, the only other realistic place for it to end up is 1989. So what do you think? Do you think that that's likely? Yeah, this is a track that we spoke about a little bit in our soundtrack episode, and we discussed then that it didn't appear in Red, it's probably going to appear on 1989 because it is a big machine track so there is an incentive for taylor to re-record it um as well it was produced by jack so jack and taylor yeah. work together all the time so that's great and yeah I, I do think it's a likely place for it to end up i think it would fit the album to be honest with you yeah, me and too. just like today was a fairy tale um was on fearless i do think that this one could probably fit. I've in my head this has always been on Taylor's version of the album, so I do hope to see it because I would I would really like it on there. I do yeah. think it fits. I would I would be so upset if we didn't get a sweet than fiction Taylor's version and I would be amazed if we didn't, especially the fact that Big Machine own it, working with Jack for the first time, having more of a pop sound. It kind of it as much as it mimics things like Holy Ground and Starlight. So I think that it, like you said, could fit really well. If so, that would mean that we'll have the original 13, then the extra three. So 16 plus these two would then mean that we would have 18 kind of tracks before we get into the vault. And how many kind of vault songs 
do you think they will get? Do you think we'll get about six again? A lot of discussion. A lot of people think that 1989 is the one that she's going to add the most vote songs to. I've even seen some people wanting the album to add up to 32 because that's her age. And, you know, she was born in 1989, so it would make kind of sense. Yeah. But I think that would be so many. I think yeah. I'd, personally, I think that would be a little bit overwhelming because it would be like yes. a whole new album, to be honest yeah, with it, you. Yeah, there'd be like almost more vaults than the, than the OG album. Yeah, they would. They would. It would literally be like a, a completely new 1989. So I'm thinking, yeah, six, seven, something like that has been kind of the norm between um, Fearless and, and Red. It just depends. Unlike other albums, we don't really know or have any clue about any leaked songs, any no. songs around the era. We have a couple of little rumours that we're going to discuss now, like I said. One thing that it always goes around is Taylor mentioning that in the era she wrote like hundreds of songs and then picked out the album tracks from there. I really think that was a bit of an exaggeration. Like, I think she yeah. might have started off hundreds of songs. It was a bit like, yeah, all too well. I had a 10 minute version. And then she was like, yeah. oh God, I have said for years that I've got a 10 minute yeah. version. I have to make this 10 minutes. Let's just have, <laughs> just between us, did the love fair made me too for like 30 seconds to push it over the 10 minute mark. You know, it's kind of like that. A yeah. slight over exaggeration. And then thinking, oh God, now they want 150 yeah. songs out of me. How am I going to? Maybe that's why it's taking so long. Because maybe, yeah, she's she's, oh God, she's I said, gonna give up. I've got 150 tracks. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's like a twenty side CD. I think yeah, probably about six is realistic. Yeah, and it really just depends yeah. on how much she had finished and left out, and how much she didn't. Because seeing that she left out for deluxe, the deluxe songs that she left out from the standard are literally amazing. The vault. Yeah, I've always really I've always felt me. Like, it, like New Romantics. Yeah. That New Romantics is like the most 1989 track ever. I know. And it's and always it's amazed me that standard. it wasn't on the standard. Yeah. It always amazed me that New Romantics, like the theme of it, the sound, like it is just, it is the album. Like, you know, it's like the most 80s sounding one and it just fits so perfectly. So the fact that, yeah, we're going to get Vault, the Vaults are going to tie up all the stories that are kind of in 1989 yes. and filling gaps and you know link songs together which is so that's the thing i find most exciting is that the puzzle there's the pe the missing pieces of the puzzle that we thought weren't missing are then added with these vault tracks like with red it was just insane how these songs tied all of the songs together so perfectly yeah. and really add it to the storyline and i think and that 1989 is going to be the same definitely honestly i think that 1989 has a few loose ends whereas red didn't have as many and even mm. then we saw some tied up but for 1989 she was doing a very specific thing and she had to be cohesive and she had yeah. to include all these songs that followed this same theme and this same whereas the era itself and the period before it where she was writing songs for it was much more messy like there was a lot more going on in her life I'm sure um, yeah. but because she needed to take this certain change and she pivoted towards pop and that she had to make and honestly she did such an amazing job um, she had to make very conscious decisions and I think that the vault tracks may open us up to more of perhaps different sounds within the album so was there more songs from that period yeah, more that she kind, kind of Nathan scrapped? Chapman yeah exactly. I, I like to call the Nathan Chapman songs okay so now we're going to move on to talking about some of the possible rumored songs for 1989 Taylor's version vault so for a period of time um the unreleased song battle also known as let's go was rumored to be a 1989 track however it's now widely believed in the fandom that this was actually a speak now album reject especially with it it's kind of um, lyrical content and themes matching up with um, songs like The Story of Us. However, originally it was felt like it was more of a bad blood kind of um, reject or similar to that. However, now, like I said, it's kind of very much believed when you listen to the track, it does sound Taylor's voice sounds a lot younger and a lot more Speak Now. And do you agree with that? Do you think that this is more Speak Now rather than 1989, despite its initial association yeah. with 1989? Yeah, some people believed it was 1989. Other people even thought Red. But I think it's basically now confirmed that it is from the Speak Now era. So we can discuss this song when we speak about the Speak Now vault at some point. Uh, but it is interesting to kind of disregard for now as a 1989 track. But it makes sense. A lot of people were connecting it to Bad Blood and how yeah. those lyric lyrical content is, is similar. Another rumoured track that we can kind of discard and dispel the rumour of is a title track. So... 1989 was the first, first album since debut not to have a title track. 
obviously barring debut because there is no song called Taylor Swift, which would be iconic, but still. Yeah. Uh, so 1989, the track doesn't exist. However, there was a picture that have has gone around for a very, very long time of a rumoured title track with some written lyrics, which some people believe to be in Taylor's writing. But unfortunately, this is fake. It has previously been debunked within the fandom. And even though it looks very real, um, and I really like the made up lyrics, which we'll read to you in a minute. Uh, yeah, they're, it's not real. Taylor never wrote this anywhere. She never posted it. I believe it was on Tumblr that it was posted. And you know what Swifties are like, we run with things very easily. And though it does have some semblance of reality to it, I don't believe that at least this isn't a title track. There could be a title track out there. But yeah, this I, isn't I, it. I do think, though, if if there was an, a title track called, oh, if there was a track called 1989, that it would be incredibly strange to not include the album called 1989. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's like with Red, like having the song Red, but calling the album Red, but just not putting the song Red on it. It would just make yeah. no sense, you know? It just would be so silly. So I think that um, as cool as it would be to have a track called 1989, I don't think it's realistic because surely it would have been included because it would be such a strange thing to name an album after something and then not, and then include not it. have a track yeah. but also taylor mentioned that the reason she called it 1989 was not because of a track but because she wanted to be inspired by 80s sound wanted to call it the year she was born you know and go with a pop direction so it was more about the uh, kind of sound and aesthetic of 1989 rather than picking a track and running with that as its name. Anyway, I'll read out these lyrics and then you can tell me what you think of them. I I do like them. I wish that it was real. But anyway, so we have the lyrics uh, which are, I'm running late, just thinking about your face and your laugh and your eyes and the way your lips taste. They're not like the most amazing lyrics ever, you know, realistically anyone. They feel like a debut, especially just thinking about your face. Obviously she's got a song called Your Face and yes, then release track. Face. Um, but I do like, and the way your lips taste, it kind of gives me very style vibes. Um, yeah. And the, the, whoever did this did a very good job of making it look like Taylor with the doodles and the heart with the wings and stuff. I think they're cute. They could be like very message in a bottle kind of vibes. Like yeah. if it was given that kind of production, yeah. Can you imagine if Taylor just randomly said, you know what, I'm taking that as my own now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is actually my handwriting. I, you know, I've created this fake rumour. Now this is a song and I've got a title track. There we are. So also, I suppose we should also discuss because of things like Today Was a Fairy Tale being included, there's kind of tracks around before and after the album was released and the era kind of lived for that are and then included on the vault or on the album track list so i guess we should discuss possible 1989 post 1989 tracks so lots of people discuss that bleachella and that, that era people associate it more with reputation however it was actually technically during the 1989 era so therefore right. do you think that bleachella tracks are likely to make the album the so say karma album the yes. scrap sixth <laughs> album do you think that these are likely to end up on 1989 so this is something that we've previously discussed as well, and some of these tracks that we're going to mention, we have mentioned on the Reputation, Taylor's version, Vault episode. Yeah. Uh, and our explanation for them there is very similar to our explanation for them here, in the fact that it's very difficult to pinpoint or bookend an era and say, okay, so this era ended this day, the next era has now mm. started, because it's not as simple as that, things bleed into each other. So they could very well be included in either Reputation or in 1989. With that in mind, just as easily as I Don't Want to Live Forever could be included in Reputation, it could be on 1989. Yeah, definitely. Because, like you said, we really technically were still in the 1989 era. And any scrap songs from that, from that time, which people love to fantasize about this Karma album, which personally... I think we've discussed, I do believe that there are songs from that time, yeah. but I don't think there was a scrapped album, no, like a whole no. thing. No, not fully uh, formed. Exactly, but yeah, they could just as easily be put on 1989 Taylor's version. Yeah, like I said, uh, th uh, This Is What You Came For, I Don't Want to Live Forever, were technically during the 1989 era, if you count eras as when the, either the lead single was released for... Yes. than album or when the album was technically released but as we know with things like on the speak now tour taylor having the red hairstyle on the or taylor having the 1989 hairstyle that they these kind of eras do yeah. bleed into each other just naturally um but yeah i personally don't feel like these would end up on 1989 because their sound was so different and they weren't 
uh, whereas some of the other songs were created post album, they were still referencing the sound of the previous of that album, you know, that they were kind of after, whereas these yeah. are very different and definitely were kind of in the sounds that she would then create for reputation. Uh, they don't really have that kind yes. of 80s synth sound. So I personally feel like if I was going to place them anywhere, they would be on reputation, but they definitely still could be on 99 because of when they, they are certainly released. very transitional in sound. Like they're yeah. not the 1989 sound, but I get exactly what you mean. Perhaps Reputation may not have a vault at all. If we're going to play yes. around with the, there will be no further explanation. They will just be Reputation and how that was like a complete album. It was a very conceptual album as well. So to then stick on, this is what you came for, if she's able to re-record it somehow, mm. and I don't want to live forever, perhaps it wouldn't be very, you know, it, maybe it wouldn't stick so well. So that that could be one of the reasons why they could maybe be put on to 1989 instead which yes. I could kind of get behind I could kind of understand you know they were played in some of the shows before yeah. reputation was even you know a thing in the fandom so it would be interesting to see what she's going to do because we know that if she does come up with 1989 anytime soon we can see if these are on here or not and then possibly predict a, you know with a bit more certainty whether they'll be on reputation instead with This Is What You Came For especially, I think that if she was to change the production, because she obviously wrote the lyrics for it, mm. but the production was all done by Calvin Harris. So obviously she's not going to get him involved as, again. So I'm thinking that if she was to, you know, produce it in a different way, kind of like a girl at home feel. Girl at home or better man, babe. Exactly. Perhaps it could work. They totally changed up the production for Babe. Um, Jack Antonoff did a really good job. So yeah, I definitely think that that is very likely that this is what you came for could sound more of a kind of synth pop rather than a kind of EDM um, dance track. So I think that, yeah, that, that is definitely likely and not to be kind of written off or discarded because I think that if it was going to end up anywhere with a different production, it could definitely fit on there a lot more than, say, so, say Reputation. But if it was stuck to its more original production or had more of a kind of darker, bombastic production, then it would fit on Reputation. So it depends where, where, where Taylor sees these songs fit, whether she sees them in the Reputation world or in the 1989 world. So up to now, what we've discussed have been rumours of songs that haven't really amounted to anything and we kind of debunked them and also songs that could fit in both Reputation Taylor's version or 1989 Taylor's version. However, one song that is pretty much confirmed to have been written around the 1989 era, but we've never got, is a song written with Diane Warren. Diane Warren is quite a legendary songwriter. She has written songs such as Rhythm of the Night, If I Could Turn Back Time, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, How Do I Live, really, really iconic songs. And she collaborated with Taylor back around 2013, 2014-ish, and at the Grammys in 2014, she was interviewed and she mentioned having written a very cool and great song with Taylor that she was very excited about. So this was in and around the red, red era still, and before 1989 had really been consolidated into what it became. So it's very interesting to see this track floating around and possibly going to be included in the 1989 vault since we never have got it for red or red vault yeah i think it's um interesting because obviously this was this was the night that 1989 kind of was officially formed and you know in taylor's head she properly kind of conceptualized the whole album so technically this song was pre 1989 being created in taylor's head so i'm not sure but obviously things like we mentioned this love was pre that as well and that managed so maybe that's maybe one of the reasons why it didn't end up on the album but yeah maybe this song was one of those that um didn't fit the new concept but it's quite interesting because obviously diane warren appears to be a kind of um writer that would kind of have really mimicked the 80s sound uh, of yeah um, you know the sound that 1989 was trying to kind of you know encapsulate so it's interesting i think that this is quite realistic um 
of being a vault track and was and she had clearly written with her at the time so I think that, yeah, this is most likely to, obviously it didn't end up on red. So again, realistically, the only other place is 989. And it was being created around the time that other songs were also being created for the album. So yeah, this is really interesting. And um, I would really, really like to see this song. I always find it really interesting when Taylor works. As much as I love her working with, you know, Liz Rose and Jack and Aaron, I find it really interesting when she works with different writers and what she kind of creates with them. Um, so I'd be really intrigued to see what her and Diane Warren would have come up with. We don't know how much was written. This kind of fits into that thought that we discussed before. These songs that, like you mentioned, the Nathan Chapman songs, the kind yeah. of ones that were held over from Red but haven't been included in the Red Vault and were probably destined to be on whatever was going to come after Red, but then things kind of changed up. So, yeah, this is definitely an interesting one and one to look out for because I do think that it could be featured. Other than everything that we have discussed, we honestly have nothing else that we know of. However, there are a lot of fake songs that have become rumours that you may have heard of here and there. But we're going to discuss them just to dispel them as these three songs are songs confirmed to be by other people. They are not unreleased songs by Taylor and thus they will not appear on 1989 Taylor's version. The first one is a song that we discussed in our Hala episode, if you will, which is I'm All Right. It was a song that was released around the 1999 era. It's a song by Jersey Green, whose voice is similar to Taylor's, so a lot of people kind of thought it was an unreleased one, but again, it is not. The next one is a more recent one. It's one that was going doing the rounds on YouTube and TikTok. It's called Daydream Lovers. Uh, a lot of people were claiming it was a 1989 cut. It is not. Again, it's a song by a TikTok artist called Lindsay Liebro. Apparently, this is the same person who did the TikTok I'm a cat, which Taylor has used. A lot of people thought it was Taylor speaking, but it's just someone who has a very similar voice to Taylor's. And oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah, yeah. It, I've it always wondered. I've always wondered. <laughs> who is the, that? The cat, because I was like, when Taylor released that, because like I said, I'm not on TikTok, and I was like, is that Taylor talking? Because it sounds a bit like her, but oh, like really? it does, but doesn't. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that, that was her. It's funny how these things all link up. Yeah, yeah, it, the, everything connects in the end. And thirdly and finally, yeah. talk about connections. We have Roses. Roses was another song that people thought was a Taylor song back during the 1989 era um, because people heard like the studio demo of it and it kind of did have that vibe of, yeah, of a Taylor. Style, style yeah, kind of vibe, exactly, yeah, the lyrics as well. However, this is a Kelsey Ballerini song. This song was then released by Kelsey. I really, really enjoyed the song. And we I think we've both discussed about this before and have recommended it previously. Yeah, on the Reputation um, Vault, I think. Uh, the Reputation it. Vault episode, we mentioned it. Yeah. yeah, so these three songs, even though they were discussed in that time, they have no truth to them. They're all songs by other artists, ultimately. Okay, so then because we haven't really got many songs to discuss, I guess we can mention some themes maybe that we might think all cross over into the vault tracks as we previously mentioned in our Halo episode we talked about kind of um driving and the themes of home um i think those will definitely follow over obviously we will definitely be getting some more songs that mention uh taylor's relationship with harry i think that is almost confirmed so. because the nature of 989 obviously it's all inspired from that period of her life I think 80s synth is also something that we'll get do you think maybe we'll get some more acoustic -y songs slightly you're in love I do, do think, think that more pop? she, yeah, I, I think that she will feel more inclined to put different sounds on a vault because again, she's not going to be so close obsessed with the like, yeah, the cohesiveness. Like, cohesive, yes. yeah. But I also do hope that we get things that she cut because she felt that perhaps the label disagreed with them. Mm. Perhaps she thought that you know I can't do another breakup song because I'm going to be you know attacked. So yeah. I'll include Welcome to New York instead, something like yeah. that, you know, which I love yeah. Welcome to New York, don't get me wrong, but I really hope that she does kind of give us things that she was a bit afraid and was holding back because, you know, Taylor now has grown up and she's kind of seen the music industry in a different way and is latently and unapologetically herself, which is great. And I hope that she can kind of give her the 1989 era Taylor just give her a second wind and be like, no, you know what? I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to exactly, say what I want to yeah. say. Yeah, so I, I do hope so. we get stuff like that. Honestly. I definitely, I definitely think so. And also, I suppose lots of the vault tracks have been produced by Jack and Aaron. Yes. So do you think Aaron's obviously traditional production is not very 1989? 
Mm. So do oh, you think oh. that he will be brought on for 929 and whether he will either do the more acoustic songs or will do more synth pop? Yeah, I, I, I think that 929 might be more collaborative in in reach of, of especially of production. We'll, we'll speak about collaborators mm. in just a minute. But I do think that it might have more of a mix to it. I hope that she can get Imogen Heap involved again to, to do clean maybe to do another secret little track that would be amazing i would, I would love that i think that image and heaps production on clean is just gorgeous and yes. her background vocals are just absolutely insane it's amazing if you haven't listened to um when taylor was on big machine she um released sorts of like karaoke cds um which don't have the um lead vocals on and they have the kind of background vocals and for 99 when you listen to clean you can properly hear um Imogen Heap's vocals in the background and they're absolutely gorgeous and if um, you guys haven't ever listened to that I would highly recommend going onto YouTube I'm sure it's probably on For there sure. or getting the karaoke CD and listening because it's it, you really really then um, value Imogen's production and her kind of input on clean because it was really really impressive so I would love her to do another vault track yeah, yeah. I, I hope she comes back I hope she does that I hope she's involved in another vault track even maybe a collaborative track that would be amazing and I do really really hope that both Max Martin and Shell back are back together me too together. I, I would really both like for 1989 that. and reputation just because they're such a specific sound yes. and obviously jack like you said we've got jack so that's great yeah jack jack's all sorted yeah and um, and, and then yeah. um yeah aaron i think like you said yeah he'll kind of maybe do some of the vault stuff and obviously christopher rowe who has done um this love Yes, so that's yes. interesting. He's always taking the place of Nathan Chapman, so mm -hmm. maybe he will take the place if there are some of those maybe early tracks that you know we are calling the Nathan Chapman tracks. Let's say maybe he will do those as well. So I'm in, really intrigued to see how it's going to be divided up because Max Martin is definitely his tracks on red. So I'm guessing that he's almost confirmed, but hopefully we get you on Shellback as well. Yeah, um, and then yeah, and then Jack is obviously confirmed. Um, Christopher Rowe is almost pretty confirmed so maybe if we don't get Imogen Heap which I would be surprised about because Taylor seems to really really want to work with the people that did did it originally and the fact that she's bringing back her band like her band um play all the instrumentation on this love and stuff um so I think that I'd be surprised if she didn't get Imogen but maybe she doesn't then Christopher Rowe will maybe take over on that as well but we shall see um but yeah I'm I'm intrigued to see where Aaron will fit in because I he may have done pop stuff I'm not very well versed in his stuff outside of his association with Taylor yeah another collaborator production wise but also lyric lyrical content wise is Ryan, is Ryan Tedder yes, yeah I, forgot about I him, hope yeah. he's back as well me too I do hope he because he, he did back. um I know places and welcome to New York didn't he yes exactly yeah. correct yeah I'd forgotten so, I totally forgotten about him yeah I forgot, yeah, yeah so would I, I knew there was someone <laughs> I yeah. hope so yeah no, that would be good. I think that, yeah, he would. And to be fair, they probably wrote other songs because I remember in the yep. voice note of I Know Places, Taylor said about how she kind of had another idea but decided to go with the I Know Places and she wanted to pitch it to him just in case. Yeah, I think that really... there's some tracks perhaps that were left behind from all of their writing sessions yeah. with Ryan Tedder, with Max Martin and Showback. Although, again, we have some of the, the left behind songs w written with Max Martin and Showback kind of on on red. Red, yeah. But you never know. There could be some stuff. Obviously, her and Jack. There could be stuff as well. Yeah. This was the you know they they worked on Out of the Woods simply, and then they did I Wish You Would as well. Out yeah. of the Woods being the first they did together, and then obviously You Are in Love. Yeah. So maybe maybe there might be anything else there. I'm not mm. sure. I hope so. And I suppose while talking about some of the voice notes, and voice memos and stuff, obviously on the deluxe version of 989, there was three voice memos included. And like you've said before, lots of fans are wanting a uh, 32 track, 32 songs on the track list. Do you think we'll get voice memos? I personally don't, no. um, yeah. because they they're not on the they're not on streaming. Um, yeah. they're more of just a kind of fun thing that you get when you buy a CD. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I personally don't think so, but I know that there's been a lot of talk about whether those will be included. And yeah, I would, with... I wouldn't think so. No, and along with that, also 1989 is the album that bangs on about wanting certain remixes. So the Love mm -hmm. Story remix, the We're Never Ever Getting Back Together rock remix, and the I Knew You Were Trouble tour remix as well. Do you think that those are likely to be on here? Yeah, I, I'm in two minds about this one because on one hand it's like, 
what would be the point? I, mm. I, you know, is 1989 Ted's version around for that in specific? Or, you know, I think people just want them because they enjoy them. And yeah. I understand wanting a studio version of them, but I don't know if they fit or not. However, no. if Taylor does want to make a 32 uh, song album, she could easily do that, including some alternate versions like the piano version of Out of the Woods. Yeah. The tour version of I don't know we're never ever getting back together whatever and like the nineteen eighty nine tour version and adding them on. I think that it would just make it a bit messy if because we never ever get back together. Rock doesn't fit on nineteen eighty nine like you know it was cool on tour but it doesn't fit the sound of the album. Mm. The love story definitely I think that that could work but I just think realistically like it's a live version you know it's not it's not necessarily yeah. intended to be on, on, on now yeah so I honestly I, I think happen. it would be a nice idea alternate versions are always very much appreciated because they make you see the, the song in such a different light yeah. however i don't think voice memos are going to be included and i don't think alternate versions are going to be included no. i think we're going to stick with the pattern that we've got up to now definitely speaking of collaborators for production we can also talk about collaborators for other artists who may be singing with Taylor. So our previous theories regarding Fearless Taylor's version and Red Taylor's version have basically led us to believe that they are usually a couple of collaborators on each of these vaults. One is going to be someone who was important or around during that era and the other is going to be someone who perhaps their sound is newer but it mimics or references the sounds and themes that are explored on the album. So for example, on Red, we have collaborators from that era or people that were, you know, around at that time period, like Ed Sheeran or I don't know, Chris Stapleton. And then we have newer sounding people like Phoebe Bridges. So those are kind of our two ideas. How are you feeling for 1989? I think this one is really hard to pick. Difficult. With yes. with Fearless, it was quite simple. Obviously, you had Keith Urban, Taylor went on tour with him, and then Moran Morris, who was obviously, um, you know, a female country artist, much like Taylor was when she released Fearless. Um, so, you know, that's quite clear set. And I think that some of the debut, I could also pick quite easily. I think yeah. people that, you know... But 1989, there were so many people because, you know, on tour, Taylor had so many people with her, um, you know, like that she brought out on tour i guess um her support acts were like um vance joy um sean mm. mendez and heim so maybe from those three but personally i don't feel like either of their sounds are very 1989 so i and don't I, considering really we think... have got like a strong... with vance joy we have yeah. got a sean mendez remix but still a collaboration and a yeah. heim couple of them now yeah perhaps you're going a different direction but yeah exactly. like you said during the era like the person who the people that were around during that period of time it's the list is so vast and also a lot of them were like models <laughs> you know a lot of yes. them were like Carla <laughs> Delevingne and Carly Kloss so yeah they're the not about that... to get on a track no exactly so it's really hard to pick and the only other people that I can think of is someone like maybe Camila Cabello um right. with the Fifth Harmony were about obviously then and they were brought out on tour um yeah. but there were so many people brought out um ellie golding was quite big during 1989 yeah. there's so many interesting choices as well because, yeah um yeah I, it, it was so vast there were so many different artists coming out on on the tour with her so it's definitely going to be interesting to see who she chooses for 1989 because 1989 doesn't have the original album doesn't have any collaborations on no. it so it's going to be, it's the same as with Speak Now. It's not an album that has originally any collaborations on it. So the collaborations or the collaborators brought on for, you know, the vaults. Vault or, tracks, well, yeah. in the case of 1989, we're, we're going to get Kendrick, I would hope and, and yeah. think, because he was added on. See, like Kendrick is such a random choice. Exactly, because I was just thinking hard. that. I was like, oh, yeah, oh, we had a rap artist. But then I thought, but yeah. then Bad Blood was changed up. It didn't really sound like it's original. You know, it was given more of a kind of like trap. Exactly. You know, like a uh, rap sound. And so speaking I, I really don't know. Of, of rap artists, what about Drake? I See, I think of Drake's reputation. So do I, which I think we discussed back mm. in the reputation. Um because obviously but... Drake posted that photo recently of him exactly. and Taylor, which was exactly. very random. 
that like that yeah. was very random to just kind of casually chuck that out in an Instagram post. Um, but I I personally feel like he is more reputation than 1989. I so really do I. Do. So the do fact I. that Taylor and... referenced him in Lover, obviously that era after it, reputation. Yeah, and, connects yeah. more. Hmm. So no, I don't think 1989. I, 1989, to be fair, is actually quite a hard one to It pick. honestly is. Another person that we discussed in the Reputation Vault episode is Ariana Grande. Um, yes. Because she was seen, you know, visiting Taylor. Taylor liked a Tumblr post back in the day. And again, this ha- this is the same as some of the songs that we said could be for 1989, could be for Rep, because it's kind of in that liminal zone in the middle. Mm. So, I guess Ariana is more of like a, I don't know, because she could go either way. She also has kind of transitioned from more of a yeah, pop vibe to I'd more of an her, R&B vibe. Her, her 2014 kind of sound of like problem and um, is more 1989, breakthrough yeah. is definitely more 1989. But I think that her, associate with Sco- her association with Scooter, the fact that he is her manager, oh, God, just yeah, is never ever going to happen. So For I, a I, minute, I had forgotten. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah, that's never going to happen really. Um, yeah. And then I suppose talking about people in their association with Scooter, an artist yes. that could fit quite well is Carly Rae Jepsen, who obviously mm. has quite a pop sound, a sound that could mimic, not, that kind of mimics 1989 sound. Um, and also she has a very kind of, uh, she also has a kind of a bad relationship with Scooter, yes. who kind of really tried to end her career. And she obviously doesn't think very highly of him and he doesn't think very highly of her either. So I no, think that no. Taylor working with her would be fine because, you know, there's no problems with Carly Rae Jepsen ever being much of a fan of Scooter. So I think that she is realistic. Um, I don't know how friendly her and Taylor are. Yeah, her sound is very, very... The sound that she was producing back in the day, like the Emotion album, mm. um, was very synthy, was very 1989 sounding. Yeah. Yeah, her Scooter was her manager back in that at that period. A lot of people attribute a lot of bad things happening in her career to him being the manager. He is not her manager anymore, although she does kind of work with some of the people that he works with. I'm not really sure of all of the connections, but I know that mm. they are somehow still connected. So again, may not mm. be the easiest thing, but I know that there is animosity. Yeah. Um, and especially from Carly Rae Jepsen fans towards him. Yeah. But if any of you guys are Carly Rae Jepsen fans, then let us know what you think. I suppose my biggest hope for 1989 is Harry Styles. Yes. I think every, like a lot of people, I don't want to say everyone because I don't want to, you know, because yeah, I'm sure not yeah. everyone, but yeah. everyone in my life <laughs> that is a Taylor Swift fan. Um, and I just desperately want Harry Styles on there. I think that it would be such a full circle moment. I don't really want a star remix. I don't no, really neither do I. A lot of people that. discuss that. I want a vault yeah. track with him on it them having a conversation yeah i don't want any rumors or any strange kind of things around it because they're both obviously very happy in their lives with completely different you know paths which is great it would help to dispel all of these things that happened during the red taylor's version era there was a lot of people that made all too well about what it's not you know the hate train came into town and a lot of people like yes. oh, she's only doing this to diss jake Gyllenhaal and blah 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 yeah but i honestly think obviously that's not the point of any of these songs no which anyone it's about ownership see. yeah exactly but i honestly think that if we did get a little collab between them which is so so much wishful thinking mm. but god i pray every night that's what um, i mean he's the only artist that i really really want on this album and it so fits. that's why I- that's it why fits. I struggle with thinking of anyone else because I'm like, I just want Harry Styles. I just want Harry Styles. Know. And if I know we it's get so Shawn Mendes after this, oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> no offense to Shawn Mendes. Yeah, Sorry, but, Shawn. But you know, I want Harry at the end of the day. You know. So do I. I just. So do I. I really, really hope so. I really hope so. But I just, I do think it's unrealistic. But it would be cool. It just would be such a full circle moment, and would really kind of help. Exactly. But then... It would really close off because. During the 1989 era, Taylor did discuss like the songs that this person, this uh, sorry, the person that this so- these songs are written about has listened to these songs. They know yeah. these songs, they enjoy them. She Obviously, was playing them, yeah, to him. Yeah, basically, we know that a lot of them are about Harry. Yeah, and they have always had nice words about each other. Uh, they've always respected each other's music, and above anything else, they are both very creative artists. Mm. And if you remember rightly, 
Back in our Halo episode, we discussed a rumor that went around for a while of music that was written between Harry and Taylor. Now, how real that is, like we said back then, who knows? And who asked for that music? Who's got that music? If it ever really came into fruition, who who even knows? But wouldn't it be amazing to have a little 1989 vault track from back in the day? Of that them? would be very cool. That would that would kind of be a dream come true. But I don't want to get my hopes up. That's the thing. No, I think that's way. the thing. I, but I just don't know. Another realistic possible inclusion of an, a collab is an 80s artist. Because yes. obviously the sound of the album is about the 80s and synth pop. So I think someone like Annie Lennox um, might be quite a realistic... Uh, inclusion i know that taylor yeah. has referenced her a couple of times and annie speaks very positively about taylor so i think that's quite a realistic um collab but other than that i just think again and much like the vault tracks in general we don't really know much don't really know who w- is likely to be on it and i think that's why there's such excitement because unlike previous uh albums like with fearless and even red we have had some suggest we you know we knew about better man we knew about babe we yeah. knew about ronan um before the album came out we also um the um inner circle had songs like i bet you think about me so we Mm. did and we knew about forever winter um in some capacity and we knew that she'd written you know that song we didn't know necessarily its name or anything but there was kind of as we knew more whereas in 1989 we literally know nothing really other than it feels like um, that there's a the lot Diana of rumors Warren. a lot of rumors a couple of interesting nuggets but in general we it, it's much more murky the water yeah. is much murkier and it's more difficult to pick out specific instances and moments again the lover diaries didn't give us anything like they did for nothing new mm, yeah it's um, true we also know about that yeah and i think that's a lot of the hype is going to be built up based upon that Obviously, Fearless's hype was just general because it was the first re-recording. Yeah. Red's hype was built upon the vault tracks, but mainly all too well 10-minute well. version. Yeah. And I believe that 1989's hype will be built around this completion of the vault tracks of this yeah. 1989 narrative. And also, obviously, that Harry Starks collaboration would just be yeah. the tip of, you know, it would just be the cherry on top. So I'm never going to shut up about that, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's really, really exciting. Hopefully we'll get some more information soon regarding if and when this is going to come, if it's going to be a summer thing or not, but it's very exciting because we are so in the dark, but all of these tiny little bits of information we have definitely, definitely show that it's going to be an amazing album. With that, that's all we know about 1989 Taylor's version. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure to leave us a like on YouTube and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our other episodes about Taylor's version. Make sure to rate us on Spotify, Amazon Music, on Apple Music, or wherever you may be listening to us to let us know that you are enjoying our episodes. Finally, for extra content, you can follow us over on Instagram, which is at Swiftly Spoken Podcast. (laughs) 